Okay. Well, good afternoon again to everyone. And hello to those of you who just joined. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation. What's next for COVID labs, testing and revenue strategy moving forward. I just wanted to say before we do the introduction of our presenters that if you have questions throughout today's call, the Q&A box is available for you to type any questions into. Uh, as our presenters have time, they'll be reviewing those questions. And if they're able to provide an answer, they will type a response and those will become visible to the entire room. Uh, if it's something that they are not able to get a response over to you on uh, during the call, we'll be taking those questions down and be following up with you uh, via email afterwards. So uh, feel free to use that for sure. Our speakers for today are Mick Rach, uh, the CEO here at Bichette. Uh, we'll, we're happy to be joined by Mike Rashardi, the founder of Miami Medical Consulting Corp and a PhD candidate who is completing his doctorate next month. And we'll also be joined by Ann Lambrix, the VP of Client Services at Bichette, who has just actually recently been promoted to president. So I should have updated that slide. For our agenda today, Mick's going to get us started with an overview of the current landscape, a look at where things currently stand in regards to COVID volumes in the United States and elsewhere, and then how the lab volumes have evolved in recent months with testing. Mike Rashardi will be covering uh, Diagnostics 101, uh, provide an overview of some current strategies for testing, look at some of the recent funding that's come down from the federal government, and then uh, look at future directions and measuring protection as the vaccine is continually rolled out. Uh, at the end, Anne will jump over and look at billing for Medicare COVID variant testing. There's been a lot of questions we've received in this area in recent months. And while Medicare hasn't quite published uh, rules surrounding this, we have had some conversations with Medicare reps about the proper way to compliantly bill for that sort of testing when you're retesting a specimen to check for variants. And she'll also be looking at the recent executive order on cost sharing that came down from President Biden just a couple weeks ago. And then Mick will conclude with some uh, final thoughts and uh, look forward to the remainder of 2021. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mick. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> Boy, some interesting uh, times, huh? Uh, would you imagine last year at this time we'd be having this conversation? I'm not sure you would. I'm not sure anybody could have could have seen that crystal ball coming. Well, the good news is uh, some things are looking better. Okay, uh, a lot of the data here provided it comes from the CDC, and uh, Johns Hopkins has a real good COVID tracking process. Also, there are a couple of great websites for this information. But if you look at what's going on overall, the United States has an 8.8. 3% positivity rate. Uh, currently, the seven-day rolling average is around 3.5, so that's good. Things are getting better. To compare this to some of the other uh, countries out there, Serbia, uh, which is a country that I, I'm fond of, at 25%, and Mexico at 45%. So there's some interesting things going on out there worldwide. In fact, I just got off another call before this, and they're, you know, they're talking about Europe and what's going on over there and how, how interesting Europe is and how they're handling some different uh, strategies right now. Now, if we look at daily confirmed cases, this is as of last Friday, the US is 63,000. The Russia is, is about 10,700 and China is still at zero. So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that the data there might be a little bit skewed, but um, it's, it's what we have. Hospitalization rates, this is another good news. You know, we're down from 16,000 patients on a seven day average to 5,400. That's a, that's a great um, change there. We're seeing some things go really the right direction. Alex, let's pop over to the next slide here. Um, so, so where do we stand? You know, remember at the beginning, well, supply was an issue. We couldn't, no one had PPE. Then it was testing. No one had, no one had the tests. We couldn't get the test actually to test the population. Then last summer, the end of last summer, it was the frontline workers are overwhelmed. And then back in December, we had the other push where, you know, ICU beds were an issue and hospitalizations were an issue. And, and now, thank God, we're, we're through some of these and we've solved some of them. Now the focus is on vaccines and, and what do we have to do to get people vaccinated to move it forward? Um, interesting scenario myself, I live in Michigan. My office is in Ohio. It's 13 miles away. I can't, I'm on three lists in Michigan. I'm 61 with two pre-existing conditions and you can't get anything. I can't get a vaccine. 
I can literally drive to Ohio and tomorrow at at 9.45, I go to, I can go to a pharmacy, walk in, I have it scheduled and get my first dose. So it's interesting how we're handling it. You know, I always look at Michigan versus Israel, for example, they both have 11 million people. Michigan has 13% of their population vaccinated, whereas Israel has like 89% of their population vaccinated, same 11 million people. So, so there's different ways to do this and there is a right or wrong way. The good news is we're figuring some of these things out. And, and the really good news is the number of people dying from this horrible pandemic is actually lowering. So that's that's a good thing. We're, we're doing something right. Let's pop over to the next slide here. Um, so so where do we go from here? Um, we, we see routine lab volume about back to normal. Although if you look, ER volumes are still down. Uh, people are still reluctant to go to the ER. That's, a, that's an interesting trend. Test volume, for example, for California went from 230,000 a day to 180,000 a day. So things are dropping there. I think we're seeing less um, screening testing as, as some changes are taking place. And Anne will talk about that a little bit later on. 26% um, fewer tests per day than in January. So, so overall, people are getting less people are getting tested for COVID. Um, I think certain universities and certain settings like that, they're getting test, tested a lot and that's keeping the numbers up. But overall, the general population, you don't see queues in, in a line at a, a, you know, for a drive-through testing place anymore. So I think we've reached that point and hopefully that's going to help uh, you know, uh, usher in the next venture here in the, the way things are going. So the growth is going to be in antibody testing. And that's where we brought Mike on. Mike, I, I think the next slide's yours. I'd like to turn it over to you and uh, have you have you tell us what you know. And uh, real quick, Mike, I just wanted to say, I might've sold you a little short on the bio there. So feel free to talk a little bit about the, the work you've been engaged in. Uh, sure. Uh, pleasure to be here, guys. Um, so uh, my name is Michael Ricciardi. I'm a, a immunologist, biochemist, biomedical engineer, jack of all trades, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call me. Um, I kind of uh, wear many hats um, in the, the variety of uh, uh, things that I do. So, um, you know, I've been working in laboratories since I was a kid. I've, I've always enjoyed doing experiments and seeing things that no one else has seen. So um, just a little bit about my background, in addition to the academic work and discovering new therapeutics and testing the efficacy of those therapeutics and large animal models, I've been uh, working on developing diagnostics for maybe the last seven years. Um, and this all happened when I was in grad school in uh, University of Miami down in Florida and Zika basically took over. Um, everybody was, you know, crazed. In hindsight, it kind of is a lot smaller of a a scenario than uh, coronavirus, but it's, it's really interesting because a lot of the principles of infectious disease and outbreak remain the same. So in that instance, you know, I took a drug we were working on and applied it to diagnostics. And uh, what that really taught me is that, you know, these two disciplines, diagnostics and therapeutics and vaccines, um, they really all go hand in hand. And, uh, you know, ever since I've, I've really included diagnostics as part of my uh, academic work and, and, uh, and, you know, private company work as well, since uh, um, there's certainly the need. So I'd like to start just talking about diagnostics in general. And since you are all doing, you know, some type of COVID diagnostic work, um, I'm gonna use the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus as my primary example. Um, diagnostic testing, you know, has two major pathways. The first being direct detection of a virus or, or infectious material. Uh, in the case of SARS here, uh, we can do antigen testing or, uh, you know, some type of genomic testing. Um, this is typically the, the gold standard, but there's a, a lot of things that really impact this type of testing. Like when you take the sample, when you onset of symptoms, the virus amount, the site of sampling, um, that, that can all really drastically impact um, this direct type testing um, for virus. Um, and, and not just this virus, but plenty of other viruses. Um, this type of testing can also vary in, in uh, sensitivity. The difference between antigen-based testing and genomic testing is significant. Uh, genomic testing, we can detect a single viral particle. Um, and antigen-based testing, I mean, you need like a thousand uh, units of that specific protein just to maybe get a signal. So you have to keep these things in, in consideration um, while you're doing that. Um, now, sometimes you actually can't even find the virus, um, but what you can do is look at the immune system for hints that the virus was there. Uh, typically, B and T cells uh, are kind of, you know, the, the goals here. And uh, the, the cells have a variety of functions to fight viruses, and there's a variety of tricks that we use um, when we develop diagnostics to interrogate um, those responses for breadth, specificity, and, and timing. Um, next slide, please. So the current strategies uh, for testing have three major buckets, uh, lab-based, uh, site-based, or point of care, and uh, direct-to-consumer or, or over-the-counter. 
Um, just looking at the FDA's website yesterday, there were 224 EUAs approved for molecular testing and PCR. Um, many of uh, additional approved uh, laboratory developed tests are, were, were also approved. And there's also some that are not approved that people are still doing, but um, you know, that, that uh, has some impacts on billing that I'll let uh, the Vachette team uh, talk about maybe today, maybe, maybe another time. Um, but there's plenty of others, um, and this can impact billing, like I said. Um, 72 uh, serological-based uh, tests currently available through the, um, the, the FDA EUA looking at antibodies, and then there's 15 for antigen test testing. Um, many of the above have uh, home collections as well that you can send back to the lab, and that can um, you know, impact samples, sensitivity, and, and specificity as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, recently put out a huge amount of money, uh, $46 billion um, under the Public Health Services Act. Um, Seven billion of this is, is specifically for testing. Uh, and an interesting strategy uh, that I saw when I was going through this bill was there's an additional two billion for substance abuse testing in healthcare workers. As you can imagine, burnout is tremendous um, and, and people who have to be working in the hospital have to be on their game, you know, 24, seven, seven, all year round for, for, for at least about a year now, um, you know, that is a, an interesting um, component that if your lab isn't already doing, um, you know, drug testing, something to, to consider um, perhaps adding. Um, another thing that's, that's really important here is the focus on evidence-based strategies, you know, the tried and true testing methods. And the reason I say that this is really important, because if any of you are interested in developing your own tests, it can be very tricky if you don't follow the specific framework for building a test that's been laid out by the current FDA requirements and CDC testing algorithms. So yes, you know, a bunch of people probably have approached different labs with you know, utilizing new equipment or methods. And, and while a lot of these can be fruitful, it really needs to be carefully vetted and checked to see whether it falls within the current guidelines despite how well it works, um, or the FDA will never let you use or sell it. And uh, you know, as a personal example, we developed a, a Zika diagnostic test um, for IgG-based testing, which is used for a lot of other viruses but um, the CDC did not have IgG-based testing as part of their testing algorithm. And despite how good the test was, uh, the FDA was like, we can't touch this because the CDC said not part of the testing algorithm. So just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, next slide, piece. So vaccines are another uh, super important issue that uh, impact how testing will develop moving forward. Vaccine rollout means people will have antibodies against the virus uh, and they will also have um, it against the vaccine. And this can vary from one to another. There's mRNA vaccines you probably heard about, adenovirus-based vaccines, heat and activated uh, whole virus vaccines and protein-based vaccines that haven't even come onto the market yet. Um, all these different varieties will all elicit different types of immune responses. So how we test it is going to vary tremendously. And knowing which test to use based on what their patient history is, is also um, you know, really valuable here. And I wanna stress that the first generation of vaccines here are to prevent hospitalization, not sterilizing immunity. And what sterilizing immunity means is that you're 100% protected from viral replication. Since these vi vaccines do not do that, what that means is that you can still get infected despite having a vaccine. You know, although it'll likely be at a lower rate and symptoms will be uh, you know, not as bad in the short term, there's still going to be new infections. Um, furthermore, uh, since these vaccines are, are relatively new, longitudinal samples have yet to be assessed for the duration of protection. And this is critical. And what we can um, you know, infer from other viruses, for instance, SARS-CoV-1 and uh, MERS, is one to two years post-infection, natural infection, everyone was protected. But five years later, their ability to prevent reinfection with those viruses waned, and they were now susceptible to repeated infection. So since the whole world won't be vaccinated for some time, and uh, new infections are, are definitely going to occur um, despite you know, the vaccine still being uh, rolled out. And you can imagine travel into third world countries, um, you know, like to go to Brazil, it's going to be a long time to get everybody vaccinated in Brazil. It's a humongous country and they don't have the same resources that we do here in the US. So it's really important to take all these things into consideration. Um, another issue about that is that this can also push variants due to the selective pressure of the vaccine. And, and, and I guess my point is why I'm trying to say all this is um, I think you're still going to be doing coronavirus diagnostics for, for several years um, to come. So, you know, don't, I, I wouldn't, you know, panic and, and think about leaving the space entirely, but um, perhaps keep these things in mind, you know, as you're, you're designing your business plans, uh, you know, to move forward. And, and another thing to mention, clients usually ask me because, you know, their customers want to know, 
these like three big questions is one, how do I differentiate between vaccine induced antibodies and natural infection? Two, how do I know my vaccine is working? And am I protected from the variants, whether or not I had a vaccine? And then three is when you have a, a respiratory illness, a, a couple months, you know, six months, a year from now, how will you know what you have? Um, you know, is it worth testing for coronavirus or not? And, and how, how's that all going to work out? So uh, next slide, please. So how to differentiate between vaccine-induced antibodies or natural infection. And this is really easy. We can simply modify an existing IgM or you know, IgG ELISA that we've already developed for SARS-CoV-2 um, and modify that. So the certain parts um, of the virus that were included in the vaccine are expressed. And then other parts that are only in, included in the virus are expressed on the, that same uh, test. And that way we can differentiate really quickly whether or not you were infected with the whole virus or you were vaccinated with a piece of the virus or an mRNA or some protein base that, that, that's very, very specific. That's a simple fix, a simple pivot, something that you can add to your, your current existing um, you know, lab-based techniques that, that, are, that, that will, will greatly help. Um, the second thing, and this is really the, the most important question, is how do I know my vaccine is working and if it will protect me against the variants? So realistically, as I just mentioned, the traditional lines is IgM and IgG, those are binding based. It just tells you if you have antibodies that bind the virus. Just because you have antibodies that bind the virus does not mean that those antibodies can actually neutralize the virus when the virus is replicating inside of you. And that's, that's really the important question here. So it's a measure of function, right? So the, these functional based assays are both complex and simple. And they can be developed, and some are actually in development that I know of, and there's already some that are, are very close to FDA submissions if, if they haven't already been put out. But the point is, is that this is a great asset because it's a simple pivot utilizing existing standard lab equipment, and meaning that you can apply that for a variety of diseases, but specifically with SARS, against all the variants. We can test against the current or original circulating variant, uh, circulating virus, and all these variants that are popping up. And then to test against new variants that will pop up because they're going to, um, is very, very easy. Um, another nice thing about these assays, you can combine the screening for infection with an IgM, IgG, ELISA with the neutralization. So running these things in parallel can really help you, you know, look at a lot of different things. Um, these assays have a little slower turnaround, um, which isn't exactly the, the worst thing, but just so you guys have a, an idea, we're only talking about a day or two to run these types of assays. They're not, they're not weeks. Um, and the last part is, you know, how will you know what you have, you know, a year uh, down the road? And the really easy answer to that is we can multiplex these molecular tests um, with, in addition to the, to the measure, measure of function, uh, in acute infection, we can just look at different, several different targets all at the same time. And, and this is really, really simple. Um, next slide. So the other big question that you know everybody's asking is all about variants. And uh, there's just a significant interest in, in variants at the moment. Um, these variants have developed, like I said before, you know, due to selective pressures, viral fitness, this is basic biology. So these will continue to develop over time, uh, really meaning the vaccines will need to be modified and, and symptoms and outcomes you know, may change in infected individuals as well. Um, and that being said, you know, what can you do about this? So you can review and modify your existing PCRs and, and sites that are uh, to, to target different sites that are extremely conserved and, and really are um, incapable of having mutations. And then we can look at other stuff um, and furthermore, you're also already extracting viral RNA as part of your PCR-based uh, detection methods. So with that extracted RNA, you can actually amplify it and look at its sequence. So you can do sequencing as well. And this sequence tells you, you know, a ton of information about the virus. But um, for you guys, I guess maybe the um, specific thing is, you know, do I buy sequencers? Do I send this material to a third party? Who does the analysis? You know, all these, I think, are important questions. And um, these are things, you know, to, to really consider in terms of, you know, margin and volume and uh, training and how you guys, you know, want to operate your individual labs. But these are things that certainly can be done. And the last thing, the next slide, please. Um, the last thing I want to mention is, is building a lab and acquiring equipment is actually <laughs> usually the easy part. Um, having the right equipment, though, having the right protocols and a well-trained staff is really what allows you to pivot quickly and pick up these new techniques. Uh, for instance, regarding training, um, there's a pretty easy opportunity to do the variant sequencing analysis in-house. You may want to send it out, but do the analysis in-house. 
And that's really easy to do with, you know, a lab technician who's had some proper training. Um, and that's something, you know, you can certainly help with. Um, having the right equipment and protocols in place also allows you to, you know, work on other viral diseases that you might not have, you know, currently started um, testing for, like STIs, GI-based viruses, and a lot of these other viruses that can lead to, to chronic disease. And, and, you know, the last thing I would just want to point out is that COVID is certainly not the last disease to come across, you know, from, you know, wherever it came from into humans, there's certainly going to be many more. Um, and being able to pivot quickly will really, uh, you know, ensure longevity of your lab. Next slide. Well, thank you for that, Mike. I uh, really appreciate it. And it was a really thorough, broad overview. Um, as I mentioned, if anyone has questions for Mike uh, specifically, feel free to pop those in the Q&A uh, throughout the rest of this call. There is, is his uh, contact information as well, and that will be available when the recording and slides are sent out tomorrow morning. So feel free to follow up with him directly. And now we'll turn it over to Ann. Thanks, Alex. And Mike, that was awesome. Thanks again. Um, for someone that's not clinically minded, but working in the billing world, it, it certainly helps to, to have that explanation. Um, so talking with variant testing, um, again, I think this is something that we're going to see more and more, and we're starting to see more questions about how do we bill um, when we're, we're billing for variant testing. Um, it, there hasn't been any, uh, I would say, documentation, um, something black and white that we can produce. However, um, we have had information from uh, contacting Medicare where they have indicated that you can bill uh, the U0004 um, multiple times. So uh, you can bill it twice um, and there is an MUE of two. So it does allow for two occurrences within the, the same day um, for this test. So um, that's good news. Um, what I have been advising is, you know, again, with any new type of um, billing or, or, or type of testing until they've uh, again, provided some, some coding guidance um, we may see something coming out from AAPC or a, um, AMA, um, uh, the, the Coding Institute. A lot of times they'll, they'll come out and, and provide that guidance. But at this point, um, the guidance is to use that U0004 uh, um, and, and build that uh, with, with the, the two units. And again, um, the, the payer should process and pay that, but we all know um, in this world that that, that is the, the best case scenario. Um, and you would want to make sure that you're, if you're doing the billing or your billing agency is monitoring. I've certainly advised to test it out and make sure that you see um, that you're getting paid and you're not receiving denials. Some of the things that I, I wrote down to just make sure I'm advising is again, you may see um, where these, um, you're, you're gonna bill for the variant, you're gonna bill two units. And even though you're allowed, the payer is going to bundle it. So you're gonna get a, a bundling denial, uh, like a CO97, or you may see a duplicate denial, CO18. So again, we always advise to make sure you're monitoring um, your reimbursement um, for this, these testing and, and, and making sure that you address any issues with those payers directly. And what if I want to test for all three variants on one specimen? We um, you would just bill it. Again, you build initially with the, the COVID test. And then if you want to bill for a variant, you, you, want, to, you want to test for variants, um, that would be a, a separate, um, again, a test. So it would be a, a, a separate run and you would build two units. So that variant test, I believe when you're testing, um, it, it would be inclusive of that one code, the, the 0004 or three, if you're using that. Okay. Um, and again, the MUE, the medically unlikely edit on the triple four is two. So they are allowing for multiple tests to be run within the same day. Um, again, to keep in mind that you really should be running. So if, the, if you have a positive COVID test, then you can check for that variant. So there should be a diagnosis of a positive COVID. Um, does that make sense, Mick? Might have dropped off there, but yeah, that's, that's okay. That's yep. All that's, right. Yep. Thank you. For uh, that. And yep. it wouldn't make sense to run tests on a negative. Uh, Correct. Test. Exactly. So we want to make sure that the um, claim supports a positive uh, COVID test. So, and then the the second diagnosis could be the results of that um, the variant test. Again, your diagnosis is really going to support the medical necessity of running multiple multiple COVID tests. 
Okay, next slide. Um, you know, and, and again, this is another uh, item that we've been talking about, I think, for, for most of this year is just kind of understanding executive orders on this cost sharing. And um, the end of February, President Biden kind of um, made an executive order stating that, you know, if you want to, if, if someone wants a COVID test, then their insurance should pay for it. Regardless, um, you know, again, back in June 23rd, there was an FAQ that was issued that was very uh, detailed as far as, you know, um, workplace screening and um, surveillance testing. And really it was, you know, really making sure that the, um, the medical necessity was supported um, for, for either, again, positive COVID or a uh, potential exposure of COVID. This new executive order, again, um, further expands the coverage of COVID testing, which is great. Um, unfortunately for labs and for billing agencies, it still you know, ex extends out the, the gray area. Um, I was talking with the lab yesterday and we were talking about travel and how, you know, again, if, if I want to go somewhere and say, I wanna go to Hawaii, I really want to go to Hawaii. So we're gonna, we're, I'm gonna go to Hawaii and um, you know, I need a COVID test, uh, a negative COVID test in order to um, be able to travel to Hawaii. Um, how do we code that so that the payer is, is, is going to pay it? Um, really, there's no diagnosis to support just travel. So you either have a positive COVID or again, the exposure to COVID. Um, so again, this leaves, you know, it, it sounds all well and good, but again, you know, uh, th th it still leaves some gray areas of, of whether or not the insurance company, if you bill it without a supporting diagnosis code for medical necessity, whether or not they're going to reimburse it. Um, so again, the guidance or the, the advice that I'm giving is, is this is, um, uh, again, this, this helps expand um, some of our understanding or the expectation that if I want a test, I can get it a test and it should be covered by insurance. But I don't believe that this is just going to um, eliminate the issues that you may have on the back end of having to appeal with supporting di uh, documentation um, and, and again, um, making sure that you have policy to support your process for, um, for billing patients insurance for, um, again, travel or for um, billing for, um, we'd say, uh, screening tests. Yeah, I think that's that's still the big issue here is even with testing being down, there's still hundreds of thousands of tests being done every day. And, and you know, people want to believe that just because you're getting a screening test that it'll get paid somehow. And we're seeing this with a lot of labs that are doing working for communities and schools and such. And they were all being paid on a client bill. Now they're saying, no, we're not going to pay that anymore. You have to build this insurance. And the insurance is saying, you know, like a pap smear or or, or a PSA test, you can't have one every every week. It just that they won't pay for it. So that's that's the pinch point right now. Real real quick, Ann, I see that um, someone raised the point that Medicare generally requires a physician order. Yeah. And now, of course, that was the understanding before this executive order came down. But like you said, it creates some more gray area there because if I'm not mistaken, I believe the you know the press release on this order specifically stated. Uh, if, if someone wants to travel with, you know, no exposure, no medical necessity, you know, for having to test, that test would still be covered. So that speaks to some of the gray area you're talking about, right? And we're going to have to just see how this plays out moving forward. It does. Again, I think that that it does, to me, um, you know, to answer um, the, the question, Medicare generally requires a physician order, you're right. And, and so we have to kind of think of... Um, uh, again, drive-through testing, and um, if I go to an urgent care, and I, again, I want, I want to go, I want to go to Hawaii. Um, as a lab, you're not, you may not have a physician order, but based on the um, the guidance. Um, really, there should be some sort of medical necessity. There should be, the physician should order these tests. And so it may be um, important for the lab to put together policy to say, we require a physician order. And we, if, if you don't have one, then again, it's going to be cash. Um, it, it really, uh, you know, you're not submitting a physician order typically with your claim. You're billing a claim with your, your CPT code and a diagnosis code. So it is really making sure that you have the supporting documentation if the payer comes back and, and one, 
denies you. So you can say, well, you need to pay me because X, or if they come back and uh, recoup or do an audit, you can support that the, the, there was medical necessity or the physician did order um, the test. Um, it was medically appropriate. Well, thank you for that, Anne. And uh, I see uh, you're, we missed that last question on whether you'd need a modifier for a second billing of uh, the triple zero four. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that before we move on? Yep. Um, and I was just responding to that. So thank you, Christina, for the question. Um, again, this is this is new. So typically in billing, when we're billing multiple units, um, you know, it depends on the payer and depends on whether or not they have their system set up to accept two units for this particular HICPIC code. Um, if if you're billing one line with two units, then you may not need uh, the modifier. If you bill um, one line with one mod or one unit, and then the next uh, the next line with an additional unit, they may require a, a modifier to avoid their their duplicate edit. Um, again, this is where I highly recommend if you're going to start billing for variant testing, you're billing multiple units on the same day for the same date of service making sure that um, you're monitoring or testing this out initially to see what some of these payers are gonna do. And, and so that way you avoid a lot of backend rejections and have to, to make a lot of changes. Thanks, Ann. All right, we'll pass it back to you, Mick. Well, obviously we're in interesting times. So, you know, I, 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 as a businessman, you know, you have to look at how do you, how do you handle change and how do you get into new markets? And when we look at what's going on here with COVID and you look at what, what Mike was talking about and the, the testing that's gonna take place and the changes coming in there, you have, to, you have to be able to survive the barriers to entry to get into new markets. So if you're a lab and you're saying, hey, I wanna start doing this different level of testing, perhaps you already have the infrastructure built to do this or, or you don't. And if, and if you don't, you gotta ask yourself, if I build it, what's my, What's my run rate? How long is this going to be profitable? How long is this going to stay around? In the crystal ball, if I hear Mike correctly, and I hear some of the other people I've talked to saying, we're, we're not done with testing in general. Yeah, maybe it's down. Maybe it's not going to be like it was last April and May, but we're going to continue to have these outbreaks and we're going to continue to have to have ways to testing to test for this. So um, the, the, the question comes down very simple. Can you, can you lower your cost to the point where you can make this profitable and keep going forward? And do you have the right, correct business model with sales and marketing to let people know you exist? I, I have a feeling the government will reach a point where they no longer pay 75 or $100 for, for COVID tests. And when that happens, you know, the person that can do this COVID test for $22 all in and, and make a 35% margin is probably gonna be the one that survives. The other ones that, who, who are, you know, they only have a margin of in single digits, they probably, they probably won't do it. So when I, when I look at who survives this, what does it look like next fall or maybe even next spring when all is said and done, you know, we ask ourselves, you know, who are the winners here? And the winners are the ones who take their business and take the, the money that they've gained from this, this bolus of cash for COVID over the last, it's gonna be probably a 24 month period. Those, those that can use that to, to expand their infrastructure, hire better employees, um, lower their costs and, and continue their, their presence in the marketplace will be ones that succeed. The ones that, that take the money and run, those are going to be the ones that struggle. They're also going to probably be the ones we're end up involved with an audit. We, uh, we have a webinar coming up later on this year on um, the year of the audit, because when you look at all the stuff that was pushed through the portal at the beginning, and even in June and July and August of last year, and even now we're seeing some interesting COVID billing, um, there, there's some things that, that, that the OIG uh, is going to look into and the IRS is going to look into. They've already come out and said this is going to be one of their initiatives going forward in 2022. So we, we're going to see some interesting there, things there too. Alex, do you want to handle the Q&A? Yeah, I, I see that uh, Ann's responding to a few of those questions there. And uh, I know we're at the end of our slides here. Uh, let's see. And are there any that we can tackle real quick uh, live here, um, or would it be easier? Yeah, to I'm writing up on some the back for follow up. I, Again, I think it, it's it's really, you know, we're. I, I'll follow up with. Yep. 
when the the one that I think maybe we could speak to now is um, when insurance does deny. What about yeah? And I really this there? is where again I, I hesitate because it really depends on the denial. Um, again, it and it also depends on the 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 um, the medical necessity. So if I have again I have COVID or I have been exposed to COVID, the payers should be paying. And with this new um, uh, uh, information from Biden, um, to me, really anybody that wants to test their insurance should cover it. And so you really have to be careful of billing the patient. And there's, there's circumstances when you can bill the patient if there's, there's a denial because the patient doesn't have coverage, but that's what the HRSA fund is for. So again, I, I, you know, we can talk, um, offline, um, Ms. Snell, just as far as, um, you know, some of these scenarios. Um, yeah, ab absolutely. I, I agree with you. It's, it's a very gray area. It's hard to nail down exactly on a live call like this, but please uh, follow up with us, you know, via email. Um, we've got your questions down. We're going to try to respond to everyone that we're able to. And, and uh, real um, quick, yeah. um, uh, Emily Zimmerman asked if insurance denies a COVID test as patient responsibility, regardless of denial or whether copayment deductible, are we as a lab allowed to bill the patient? So again, this is a, a um, the what my guidance is, Emily, is that they sh the payer should not be applying any cost sharing to your COVID test. So you need to look at your diagnosis codes and you need to call your carrier and say, this is COVID, they need to pay it in full. And because of the public health emergencies, you should not see denials as out of network, out of state, um, and so there might be an issue with, again, how the payer has you set up in the system, um, but you really should be getting payment and you should be getting payment um, without patient cost sharing for COVID. Absolutely, I think that was the intent of the mm -hmm. recent order there. And now we just are kind of watching right. it play yep. out live here. So, just, I just want to say uh, thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you especially to Mike for joining us. As Ann said, we are so steeped in billing and reimbursement sometimes that uh, it's nice to have someone to be able to speak to the clinical side of things in an in-depth manner. So thanks again, Mike. Appreciate you for having me. Yep. All right.